Hi, I'm Dave Meltzer, and I'm one of the passionate few. I do thousands of interviews, and the interview with Omar and the passionate few was incredible. He not only got to the surface details, but really honed into the emotional aspects of how it felt to go from rags to riches, rags to riches, giving insights to help other people, empower other people to be happy. Welcome to this episode of the Passionate Few Podcast today. It's your host, Omar here. And today we delve deep into the story of the CEO of Sports One Marketing, David Meltzer. And for those of you that don't know David yet, I want to assure you that this is the most roller coaster story we've had to date. Because not only did David go from rags to riches, but he went back down to rags and made those riches again. Building a $120 million net worth, David found himself in the middle of a bankruptcy, which he was able to turn around to a positive mindset and staying connected to goodness. To date, Dave boasts his accomplishments in tech, business, marketing, and sales, becoming a leader in all those spaces, and has had tons of experience being executives in key influential companies throughout decades of work. In this interview, we hear how David grew up in a rough situation with not a lot of money with his siblings and was purely motivated by the ability to provide for his mom, buy her house, buy her a car, and how those motivations actually proved fruitful because David found himself making millions in his late 20s and never stopped from there. In this interview, David also talks about how he got it all and lost it all. So I want to encourage you guys to really pay attention because in this, David talks about those accomplishments, including things like being the CEO of Samsung's USA mobile division as he was the CEO of the first smartphone launch in history. So it's pretty awesome. Dave's experience goes even deeper than that. There's tons of stories. In this interview, he goes deep into the power of relationships, how to be an effective leader, and how to truly start making your life work. And also, I want to encourage you guys to pay attention because what's especially interesting about Dave's story, unlike anybody else we've heard before, is his unique motto. And that is to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. And of course, in this interview, David did exactly that as he shared the story. So with no further ado, I want to encourage you guys to sit back, relax, and enjoy the powerful story of David Meltzer. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of The Passionate Few. Today we get to sit down with the CEO of Sports One Marketing himself, David Meltzer. Thanks for being on the show today, Dave. Hey, thanks, Omar. Absolutely, man. So a lot of people know what you've done in business. Obviously, you've had your hands in negotiations, managing athletes in the multiple billions. Obviously, you've negotiated in the tens of billions, right? 10 billion plus. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about your childhood. A lot of people uh, don't know this, but you grew up in kind of a rough situation, six siblings. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I, I see it as a blessing, but it was a difficult situation. I grew up with a single mom, six kids total, five boys, one girl. Um, you know, I I grew up happy though, so I don't I don't want to portray it in any other way mm -hmm. other than financially it was extremely challenging. And my dream as a little boy was to be rich. My my mom was a teacher. <laughs> yeah, six kids, a teacher. You can imagine how much money we had. She actually had to fill up turnstiles at the 7-Eleven with greeting cards just so we'd have enough to eat. Um, too much pride to ask for too, too much help from her family. But, uh, you know, my siblings are academic freaks. <laughs> they all went to Harvard, Penn, Columbia. Yeah. And my goal was to be rich. And the reason I wanted to be rich, though, it's really interesting. Say, you know, being older now, I can see where certain things formulated in my head. Right. I only wanted to be rich to buy my mom a house and a car. I'd catch my mom crying because we didn't have enough money to eat. Or I remember the car breaking down and her just, you know, just so upset. And like, I was you know, five, six years old and I'm like, man, you know, we're two bedroom apartments, you know, seven people total. And I'm like, I'm gonna buy my mom in Akron, Ohio. Oh, okay, Akron, Ohio, so, yeah. Yeah, I was actually, uh, you know, have a great career in sports. So uh, I was born in the same hospital as LeBron James and Steph Curry. So I actually think that someday, you know, my whole, Destiny may lead me to be the commissioner of the NBA. <laughs> yeah, you were destined for. <laughs> There's something about that start. hospital that had. Yeah. And I know I'm not going to play, so there must be something about the NBA that I do. Although I own a uh, esport team, so who knows? That might be my NBA connection. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this: um, Where in your siblings are you? Are you the oldest, youngest, middle. in the middle? Yeah, middle. Okay. So and you were the only one that had that sort of hunger out the gate, or? Yeah, you know, I don't know what it is. Just born uh, with a desire to make money. Um, 
I was more a street hustler. My brothers and sisters, we had a station wagon. My mom used to pack our dinner, you know, peanut butter and jelly or bologna with mustard in a paper bag. And the older siblings would read to the younger siblings. My two younger brothers are extreme geniuses. Uh, Harvard, Penn, summa cum laude, super genius. They were just academic from the day they were born. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, my oldest brother being a doctor and like everyone was just very academic except for me. I, I went to school, you know, to play football, to play sports, to meet girls. Right. Now, I had a tremendous amount of academic pressure. So don't get me wrong. I got one B in high school and you would have thought that I was the low end of the gene pool. That, you know, yeah, my career yeah. was over. <laughs> so then after that, what what happens? Do you sort of like, where's the pivot where you start trying entrepreneurship? You start dabbling in that? Where did that begin? Yeah. You know, what what happened to me was I, I believe my entrepreneurship started with wanting to be a professional football player because I think it takes courage to follow your passion, to have a purpose um, and to tie it to profitability. Right. Anyone. I was never really an innovator. Mm-hmm. Right. People get confused between innovation and entrepreneurship. So it wasn't like I invented things. I came up with ideas how to make money. Right. But I wasn't like tinkering in my garage. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's an innovator. An entrepreneur, you know, like Ray Kroc, they could take someone else's great system innovation, and just like, make it you know, a speedy own. service system right. and make billions of dollars from it. That was me. You know, I did come up with some cool ideas before their time that other people monetized. But, you know, my whole thing was first football. Uh, and I worked really, really hard. Uh, got a scholarship to college, played football in college. Freshman year, first game, I got ran over by Christian Okoye. Wow. The Nigerian nightmare. I decided, damn, I better start stunning. First game. <laughs> first game. My very first game. I was a bullet on the kickoff team against Azusa Pacific. Very first game, freshman year, 147 <laughs> pounds, lightning fast. Yeah. And I flew down there and I hit that guy on his thighs as hard as I could, airborne straight back, and he literally stepped on me. Wow. And it was a different ball game. I said, wow. I thought I was really good, you know, I, you know, best on my team in high school, even though I was small. And sure enough, those dreams died. And the next entrepreneurial thing was, okay, how can I be rich? Well, back then doctors were rich. And so I thought I'd be a physician. I go over and visit my brother. He was at the hospital and uh, he was doing his residency, you know, brilliant brother of mine. And I said, man, I hate hospitals. <laughs> yeah, and just the like, energy is just the energy. I, I live, I'm an empathetic. Right. And what that means is I feel things. You know, I that's why I cry a lot. You know, Gary right. Vee's a friend of mine and a mentor, and I joke around, Gary, you swear to get people motivated and connect to you emotionally. <laughs> Me, I cry. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm a 50 year old crybaby. And I'll probably cry three times in this interview. Let's do it. I've already got choked up. But, uh, you know, I went there, I told my brother I hated hospitals. He gave me the best piece of advice. And, you know, people see this on the Internet. You probably have heard it, right? He looked at me. He goes, be more interested than interesting. Right? Like, I was 18 years old. I had no idea what it's like to be a doctor. And that, that really sticks because as an entrepreneur, so many people think they have a dream. Right. And they haven't been more interested than interesting. I can't tell you, when I ran Lee Steinberg, We'll get there, but right, yeah. CEO of the most notable sports agency in the world, right? right? Jerry Maguire, any given Sunday, for the love of the game, Arliss, so many kids, 18 years old. Oh, Mr. Meltzer, I want to be just like you. I want to be a sports agent. And I think to myself, it's like idiot over here at 18 saying, I want to be a doctor, but I hate hospitals. Right, yeah. Right? They, don't, they may hate everything it takes to be a sports mm-hmm. agent. But they, they're not more interested than interested. It, it's kind of like the concept of lawyers, right? When you're a kid and you're like, oh, I want to be a lawyer because you watch movies and you see the, the two minutes they're in a courtroom versus the years that they're studying <laughs> right. and going over and the bullshit in the back room. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, trust me, man, the legal research. So and I'll get there because yeah. there I was, decided, now what am I going to do to be rich because I can't be a doctor because I can't sit in a hospital and cry all day. So that was that was always on your mind, like, I have to get rich. I have oh, yeah. to get rich. Well, buy my mom a house and a car. So so what was that voice? Now, I want to get deep because a lot of people are guided by different motivations. Yeah. So what was the actual dialogue in your mind? Like, oh, I'm going to get fucking rich. I need money. I need money. Like, what was the, if you could verbalize that sentence in your mind that you told yourself over and over, to what was To me, it? it was that, <laughs> I'm going to get choked up, but I felt that people looked down on me and my family because I didn't have money, right? So it was a duality of, you know what, all these rich kids I grew up with, they weren't smarter than me. They weren't, it right. was like football, right? right? Look, you may be bigger, but I'm not gonna stop. Like I had a competitive drive, I still do, just in a different way. But I, I remember, you know, the kids having, you know, 
cars and and people liking them and I couldn't you know what I mean and I was and like seeing them win and going man one day one yeah, day exactly yeah, yeah. like and they they'd almost like look down on me and maybe I was projecting my insecurity right but they would look down on my mom you know even in my family like I have some really successful uncles one arrogant one who you know <laughs> went to University of Chicago law school wealthy right, lawyer right. and and it was like he used to look down on my family right and like somehow he was superior and to me it was such a motivating factor dude if it's about making money trust me i'm going to make money and i'm going to buy my mom a bigger house than you'll ever own i'm going to buy mom a nicer car that it was <laughs> that was me so you had a chip on your shoulder basically. oh yeah huge chip now i want to ask you do you find that other successful entrepreneurs at your level and other executive ceos have you found that they too that was part of their mental dialogue they they too had a chip on their shoulder yeah, like I've, what what are common denominators of motivation you found from top achievers i think top achievers a lot of them have parent like tougher parental issues because you know mine were too you know my dad I, w I wanted to show my dad you know that i could be successful because right. he left right how old were you when he left uh so my parents got divorced separated when I, I was five my youngest brother just born divorced when i was seven um and he was g gone he had moved away were you close with him or i was uh and so you know here's how my dad passed last year Sorry, so here's how i described my relationship one uh from zero to ten my dad was my hero so here come crying uh, yeah. he's my hero uh from 10 to 18 i hated him <laughs> right? why, why was that he left mm, yeah right? he resented it and it I hurt was, yeah, and, yeah. And, and i had a mom that was like every time i saw my mom not get a child support check yeah yeah, yeah. right you know <laughs> right i right. despised him uh then 20 to 30 right i, I started to understand him Right, 30 to 40, uh, started to appreciate him. Uh, 40 to 50, I started loving. So that, that was my relationship. With so you guys had a good relationship the last yeah. few years? Yeah, yeah. I'd say since I was 30, there, I, I, if I can get into a little yeah, out yeah. of sequence, but yeah. what, what changed my relationship to my father where I started earning respect was one, I started loving myself. Right, my life That's got powerful. so good, yeah. right? Yeah. My life got, and so I started appreciating what he did for me. Right, because I come through him, not for him. Did but, you get any of his competitiveness, or what? What oh, traits yeah. from him did you? Older carry? I get, the more I see my father in me. Uh, Can you give so, an example or two? Uh, one, uh, super. Uh, my, my dad was su super quick, but right? I, I have this ability to coalesce and understand things in a very quick way. He also was extremely generous. Like he, money was not his god. Right, money was beneath his feet, and. That's where my transformation occurred. I had to learn that. But my dad, uh, you know, retired when he was 31. He was millionaire, bankrupt, millionaire, bankrupt. Mm. He could make money like this. He had great charisma, mm. great speaking ability. Uh, and so I took on a lot of his energy. And that's why I went bankrupt. Right. Because I was like my father. Really? It was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And he saw it. He saw yeah. it. For my 30th birthday, um, my, my father, when I was 10 years old, so I started hating him, my dad forgot my birthday. So he had this beautiful, hot step, my stepmom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was closer to my age than than, than, than his. his age. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, man, I loved her. And so anyway, yeah. he, he kind of completely started ignoring us, right? Wow. So he forgot my birthday, super hurt, right? Of course, Like yeah. he was beyond. So when I did talk to him, I said, how could you? And so he projected his insecurity and he said, well, I don't believe in birthdays. That was his his way, way of handling, out. right? Yeah, yeah. I, you're 10 now, I don't believe in birthdays. So not only did he forget my birthday when he was 10, he then had to live up to his word, and, and he didn't give me a birthday card to remember any of my birthdays till I was 30. This is when I started right, yeah. becoming friends. On my 30th birthday, my dad gave me a beautiful blazer, not as nice as that, but a beautiful one, <laughs> fit me just perfectly. So I knew not only did he buy it for me, but he must have asked one of my brothers or someone for my size. Yeah, so he cared that he extra cared. little oh, bit. Oh yeah, yeah he yeah, meant yeah. to give me a gift that meant something. Here I'm like, maybe he's gonna say sorry. That's yeah, in my mind, yeah, yeah. right? So I get this gift and I put on the jacket I, and I thought, maybe it's off the shelf, it's not gonna fit. Like I know my dad. Right, right, right. Man, it fit perfectly, right? 42 yeah, yeah, yeah. short. And of course that meant a whole lot to oh, you. It meant yeah. a lot. So then I open it up, All open your jacket for a sec, right? All, all these pockets yeah. torn out. Just ripped he, out. He ripped them out. Not even with the scissors. He literally ripped them out. So then I call him. I'm like heartbroken. I'm like, he's trying to mess with me. Yeah. This Because I'm starting to feel wow, like yeah. we were friends. I'm thinking, he's like 
made a point of something. So I'm like, dad, I got the jacket. I appreciate it, but I can't use it. He's like, what are you talking about? I go, all the pockets are ripped out. He goes, yeah, I ripped them out. And I, in my head, I'm like, you, excuse my language, you dick. <laughs> like, honestly, yeah, yeah. you know, you finally give me something really nice. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, he goes, because I'm worried about you. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you're just like me. I'm worried. He goes, uh, you're just driven by money, man. He goes, I was a multimillionaire at the time. He goes, right. I retired at 31. He goes, I know you could retire right now. He goes, and I see everything like me in you. So I gave you that jacket. I was like, was this your old jacket? How old were you at this time? You said 30, 30 right? 30, 30th, 30th birthday. birthday. Big birthday. And he said, no. He said, I go, I can't wear this jacket. I wanted to wear it to think of you. He said, I know. He goes, I never want you to wear the jacket. I was like, then why'd you give me the birthday present, Dad? He goes, because I want you to hang it in your closet and look at it every day and remind yourself, can't take anything with you, right? Can't take anything with you. So that was the energy. Sure enough, two years later, retired at 32, an asshole. Yeah. Just like my dad. Chasing money. Yeah. Wrong, wrong people, wrong ideas. My wife warned me two years later, uh, you know, as I retired from the time my wife warned me, I ended up losing everything. And that, we're talking like an eight-figure worth, right? We're talking eight figures, tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, I, on paper, over $100 million. Over $100 million. Dollars, real yeah. estate, yeah. So I owned a golf course, a ski mountain. Yeah, 33, 33 houses. Yeah, more than 33 houses. We had, I had 25 condos yeah. alone in San Diego. Yeah. Um, How old were you at this time? Uh, 36. Holy cow. Yeah, so, so I want to up to 38. I want to retract back and then we'll get there. Yeah. So talk to me about you're in college, your yeah. your, your football dreams, football and instantly. doctor dreams die. Now did that did that mess with your head too? That first dream. A lot of people talk about that first dream. You're devastated, man. Shit, there goes the NFL. Yeah. It, it, so for me, it was it was I just wasn't a quitter. Like I talk mm -hmm. about consistency, and I love football. Right. So to me, it was okay. How am I going to be involved in the NFL if I can't play? So let me just and pivot. You didn't, yeah, yeah exactly. you didn't get stuck. Just, so okay, what can I do now? That's where the yeah. whole like be a doctor in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Right, make a lot of money. Right, <laughs> then, right. then it was sports agent, right? I'll be a sports agent. I'll go ahead, go to law school, make a lot of money. Right. And so that's what I did. I started, switched to English and poli sci major, still kept a kinesiology minor, mm -hmm. a little bit of the medicine side. Yeah, I was yeah. good at math and science. Yeah. Um, now, now you're saying it as if it was fluid at the time, but was there a point where you're like, shit, what am I going to do with my life? Like, or, was there like months span or not really? You were pretty quick. Oh, no, to man. Out. I, I just yeah. picked the next thing. <laughs> yeah, you're just quick with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. Well, that's important because that translates to business. You yeah, know what I mean, I was, I yeah. was quick. There wasn't, you know, like I know kids because my feeling was always, and this was just natural, right? I have a goal, but I'll change it. I think we talked about pivoting something yeah, yeah. else earlier, right? I'm that was me. All right, I'm I'm aiming towards this, and however which way it goes, yeah, I'll take the ten, the sixty freeway, whatever it is. Yeah, as long they're as mile I get to the destination. It'll yeah, get yeah. me there. So, you know, being an English poli sci major with a kinesiology minor, I'm going to go to law school. Right. And uh, I, I went to college, by the way, to a college that is a feeder for graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I knew, you know, I was still going to go to you graduate school. You were set up. Yeah. And I went right from uh, college to law school. Mm -hmm. I went to Tulane uh, for a reason. I got into a lot of good law schools. I studied really hard. I really started to grow up as a student and um, went to uh, Tulane because they had the first sports law certificate Program. yeah it, it wasn't like it is today the leading in the in the country um and they've honored me with the dave Meltzer sports law excellence fund awesome. at my law school which is cool but i also went because they had a maritime law program mm -hmm. uh they taught international and civil uh, civil and common law so both right and they had the best oil and gas program and i got to study in greece all oh, these wow. great things yeah, yeah, yeah. so i thought well, if I'm not going to, you know, hedge my bet, <laughs> if I'm not going to be a sports agent, yeah. you know, because you, you can't make money out of the box, maybe I'll go be a litigator and be an oil and gas, international oil and gas litigator. So this whole they time. They made the most money. I literally looked up. Incomes of like the possibility. <laughs> yeah, the, the industry. Yeah. And back yeah. then, there's no internet, right? There, there yeah. was magazines. So I remember going, it was either US News Report, somebody had the highest paid professions in a magazine. So you look at one, two, and it three, literally yeah. said oil and gas litigator. Was there, That's where I'm going. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, sports agent wasn't, that was just like passion. Right, right. But that was money. And so, you know, I picked my law school, <laughs> best law school in the country for maritime law, yeah. Tulane University in New Orleans, and that was my profession. Yeah, wow. Yeah, then so, comes so, the real. Employee. So you didn't care about passion as much as the no, money. 
Well, that money was my passion. Exactly. That was going to provide me proof, legitimacy, all the thing. I was all about money. In fact, when I got married, my wife was like, got to stop talking about money. <laughs> like I, I look back in complete embarrassment about what a moron I was. I mean, I could meet you and like you in within two minutes, I'd be like, I'm a millionaire. Right. Like somehow <laughs> you try to like it wasn't even it like yeah, subtle, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. it was like I, before you saw my Ferrari, yeah, yeah. right. I would have told you, well, I got two Ferraris, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. I was that dick. Yeah. yeah. Right? You needed that validation or you totally. wanted that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And you know, I bought, and then of course I bought my mom a house and I told everybody, oh, but I bought my mom a house. Oh, I bought my mom a new yeah, Lexus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I bought... Everything you always wanted to, <sighs> you're just showboating it. Yeah. Yeah. For the wrong reasons. So, okay. So then you pick your major and yeah. then what happens? Like, I, I want people graduate, to really understand yeah, how you made your first million. This is important part of my yeah. life. So I graduate law school and I have two jobs. How old are you? Uh, I'm 24 turning 25. Okay. I have two job offers mm -hmm. at 24. Mm -hmm. Recession. So most of my class perfect timing. for a job. <laughs> I had one job offer to be a oil and gas litigator, right? And it was with a big oil company. What was the salary? Do you remember? Uh, the the base salary is like one ten. Okay. A lot of money. Right at that time. Early nineties. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good salary. Um, and then uh, I got offered a job to sell no practicing law, to sell legal research on the internet. Now, the internet wasn't what the internet was in the early 90s. It was right. phone lines and nobody knew what it was. Right. So I go to my mom, who's my trusted advisor, and I said, Mom, what should I do? Uh, oil and gas litigator or sell legal research online? Now, the legal research online job paid uh, uh, like $40,000 salary. Base, and then commission. Base. Commissions, I was fired unless I made 100 they made it very clear. You gotcha. Have, you get. You have to. Hit, your mark is a hundred minimum, plus eighty thousand dollar expense account, because gotcha. it was a lot of travel. So they gave you twenty five hundred for rent. They gave me twelve hundred for a cell phone, and nobody is a bag phone. Right. I right. Mean, yeah. So that was tax free money. So you know, I'm a money guy. Right. I'm right. thinking eighty thousand tax money? free is one sixty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. One sixty alone. Plus a base of a hundred puts me at two sixty. If I just and I can sell ice to Eskimos. Right, right. So I go to my mom and ask her she, without blinking. She said, "You got to be a real lawyer. You know, take the oil and gas job." Right. And for the first time in my life, I realized just because somebody loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. That's powerful, right there. It was so many times I and because what happens if I would have taken my mom's advice. She only wants the best for me. Right. The safest, the, the safe, smoothest. Right, whatever is yeah. her value. But what does my mom know? You know what my mom said about the internet? Why I shouldn't take the internet jab? Because I was leaning that way. Right. She said, the internet, Dave, is a fad. <laughs> yeah. I know we laugh now. Yeah. But, but there, literally, there was no like someone telling yeah, you yeah. the esports is a fad. Two years ago, I had owners of professional NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL teams tell me esports is a fad. Two years ago. Yeah. So I'm not embarrassed to tell you my second grade teacher mom thought the internet was going to be a fad. Right, yeah. So I, you know, completely went against my mom and I took the job with one promise to her that I would take the bar because she was convinced that I was going to fail within a year. Pass the bar and exam. I, I passed the bar exam. By the time I passed the bar, take the job, I'd fail. And I just, it wouldn't have slowed me down any. And there'd be another oil and gas job. Right, right. It would always be there, yeah. And she had. Now, was the was the bar exam hard? Was it as hard as people make it out to me? I do want to ask. Uh, it's, <laughs> I didn't find it hard, to be honest. You know, because now I had an advantage. I had, at that time, I was engaged mm -hmm. to a very, very wealthy girl, which I ended up breaking it off. But her dad set me up in his country club home. <laughs> yeah. I, all I had to do was take the class, study. Right. We had food minimum and golf. Like yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was so like perfect setup. Would, yeah. yeah um, it's a lot of pressure more than it is difficult, you know, because your whole life rides on passing that exam. Right, yeah. Um, California is the toughest uh, by far. Um, so, uh, you know, but I passed the bar. And ironically, I did extremely well in the state exam, which, you know, going to law school in New Orleans, I was a little worried that I didn't understand the state law, the federal right, right, side yeah, of defining, yeah. but I passed. Um, so anyway, I take this job and this is where I got laser focused. N now it was like training, training, and you finally make the NFL and you're going to prove to everybody. It's game day. Yeah. That I'm Baker Mayfield. And you have <laughs> questions about how great I am. Yeah. And I was like Baker Mayfield, right? All over the place. Right. But meanwhile, 
here I am, a top draft pick for this great team, West Publishing, yeah. great job, and I'm now out of the gate. Right. And I'm going to prove myself. So I get laser focused. Unlike Johnny Manziel, I was laser focused like Peyton Manning. I was in the film room <laughs> every day, meaning I worked every hour that I could. My goal was to be rich. So all the guys that were 50 years old, I was the youngest one ever to get this job. They normally have four years of legal experience to get it. I actually told the guy that uh, Lou Lombardi, who was a vice president, he said, Dave, you don't have four years of litigation experience. Why should we hire you? And I said, I'll tell you why you should hire me. Because they were hiring four people. I said, you hire me, keep all my commissions. Now, meanwhile, he didn't know where my head was with the expense account and salary. Right, right, and I right. knew if he kept my commissions, I was making more money than taking the Anyways, law job. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. would be a lot easier yeah, flying yeah, around, yeah, staying yeah, in yeah. hotels, eating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the way my mind works. Yeah, yeah. But I told him, if I'm not in the top half of the first four guys, six months in, fire me and keep my commissions. Wow. And then he looked at me and he said, we had no cell phones back then. He said, you got a picture of your, your uh, girlfriend, fiance? I said, yeah, yeah. Open my wallet. Yeah, I have these little pictures back then. You carry yeah, your yeah, wallet. Yeah, yeah. I handed it to him. True story, he looked at that picture and he said, you're hired. Wow. I said, what? He said, you're hired. I said, why? He said, excuse my language, but this is what he said. He said, if an ugly fuck like you can get a girl like this, <laughs> you must be able to sell. And that's literally yeah, how I got, got this it. job. So I get wow. laser focused. I work seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I outsell everybody in the whole company. We had seven, 17 billion in revenue as a company. I so, outsell so, every guy. So talk to me, what exactly were you selling? I was selling legal research online called what? Westlaw. Of what? What was the research? All the state, Just all sorts of stuff. Case law, secondary material, statutes of America. You know those books that have the keys behind every lawyer on a cheesy yeah, commercial? Yeah, yeah. They were now putting <laughs> those online. Yeah. And they created something called Westlaw. So you were selling to like websites or all online lawyers. Bases. I was selling to every lawyer in the country. Got gotcha. so cold calling. Government, prisons. They had accounts because they had yeah. sold them books. Gotcha. Yeah. It was a big company. Um, so it was kind of like being, I would say the closest thing would be a pharma rep or a medical device rep. Yeah, yeah. Is that kind of pay? Do you remember your commissions per per deal or what what it was? Yeah, of course. So you know, because they were you know building the market, we could make between twenty and thirty percent commission on a deal. Okay. Some of the deals could range in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So within nine months, they had to change the comp plan on me. <laughs> yeah. I was a millionaire in nine months. Yeah. Really? I, I outsold the next guy down from me. Yeah. Three to one. So you're twenty four, twenty five. Twenty five. Never had really money in your life before. Never. And within 12 months, nine months even, multimillionaire. Yeah, never changed my suit. I had three hand-me-down suits for my good buddy who dad owned a suit store. Mm -hmm. Three hand-me-down suits, wore my shoes till they had holes in them. I got $25 a day per diem, no matter what I had. Right. So what I did is I went back to the, to the five-year-old and I ate peanut butter and jelly because it was an extra $275 a week that I could put to my law loans. Uh, right. I, I, I hit it hard. I took in nine months, I had a million dollars and I went and I bought my mama house, my mama car, and I paid back my law loans, which my uncle had to co-sign for me because, you know, no credit, et cetera. So he was always concerned that I wouldn't pay back my law loans. And what was fueling you this whole time was just that mental dialogue. I have to do it. I have to. Do it. it was an urgent priority. I wanted to one. I wanted to help my mom, but I also underneath that wanted to prove that my mom was better than everybody else because she was selfless and sacrificed for her children and her children's success was my mom's success. Yeah, so, yeah. so you want to make her proud. Harvard, yeah. Right, you know, summa cum laude, my other brother, Penn, Wharton, you know, Columbia, you know, doctors, all these great, and, and there was my mom who I felt, probably not true, that people looked down on, right? She was driving this beat up, Ford Granada, right. right? Terrible clothes. We couldn't afford. When we went to McDonald's, I talk about this in my book. Highlight for me of going out mm -hmm. as a kid was to go to McDonald's and get two large French fries for six kids poured in a bowl, wow. right? That was to me like heaven. Yeah. Right. So you can imagine when I'm on expense account. Still today, <laughs> one thing I love about Warren Moon, who's my yeah. business partner today, he grew up with six sisters, poor single mom, same way. And we both still have the, he's 60, turning 62, I'm 50. Mm -hmm. 
we go out to eat in the finest restaurants in the world. We'll fly into into cities and, and create meetings because we hear there's a good restaurant. <laughs> yeah, good steak. We're foodies, right? Yeah, yeah. But we're both like two, you know, inner city kids that sit there and look around and go, I can't believe that I get to eat here. I remember the first yeah, hotel yeah. room I stayed in by myself. Yeah. Right? It was a Hyatt. You might as well thought I was at the Ritz Carlton in the penthouse. I called my mom, right? And I was like, oh my God, I'm in my own hotel room. Yeah. You know, that, this so these is are like surreal moments because it was everything you always wanted and it was right there. Yeah. So that's your first million. Yeah. So talk to me from there. How do you go on and start scaling and start moving into sure. the executive positions? Because a lot of people don't know that you're also the CEO at one time, you're the CEO of the first uh, smartphone launch ever. For Samsung manufacturer. Sure. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, three years into my career, something lucky, well, I would say the harder you work, the luckier you get. Right. Opportunity arises. Uh, Thomson Reuters buys my company that I work for. And because I had done so well, I had started, they started videoing me to train people. They had people traveling with me. They made me a uh, you know, sales manager where I'm selling <laughs> right. and managing people. And I'm in my 20s. Right, Most yeah. of the people are in their 40s and 50s because this is a serious job. It's like being a medical device rep. You know, you yeah. got to have some skill. And, and do you find, I do want to ask, do you find that the difference really, obviously, like you were saying earlier, you're made of the same skin, same flesh. The difference was just the intensity in your mind of like hitting the goal, right? The urgency. Yeah, it was desperation too. Were you good at sales or was it just the pressure that forced you to get good at it? I mean, were you reading personal development? Was it natural? I mean, that's a great question. So I believe there's two types of salespeople. There's an eagle and there's a journeyman. I was born an eagle, right? I could sell ice to Eskimos. I was a kid that was figuring out I could talk, <laughs> I could talk, yeah. I could persuade people, I could connect to you emotionally. But where I became really good is when a guy named Mike Bosworth started to mentor me. He created something called Solution Selling, which then sold to SPI, the Sales Professional Institute. But Mike was an IBMer, blue, blue, blue all the way, solution selling, consultative sales. Mike Bosworth taught me to be a journeyman. So I had you know, passion, purpose, and profitability. The, the profitability side was natural. I was a much more natural salesperson than I was a football player. Mm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what I you're saying. But I had this journeyman mentality that when I learned how to be a professional salesperson, to practice and videotape myself, work and, on the craft. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I am, a, I mean, I'm a sales professional now. What would you say are your top three keys to being an effective salesperson? Number one, understand you got to, people buy on emotion for logical reasons. Number one, people buy on emotion for logical reasons. If you don't connect emotionally, you're done. Two, 120 rule. I carry an energy of being of service and of providing value. So for me, if I'm not walking into the room believing mm -hmm. that whatever I'm selling you, sales, product, service, whatever it is, if I'm going to believe and carry an energy that I'm giving you $100 and only asking you for 20 back, because when I believe that in my heart, if I have that in my energy, there's no reason you won't want to move forward. I can sell anything in that way. And then the last thing is don't do business with dicks. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I'm not going to do business in sales. You know what? It's not worth it. If, if I have someone that, you know, is not honest or is, is a jerk, there's somebody else to sell. Yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And obviously that's something you learned in retrospect, right? Because oh, there was a time where you take the money from anybody, right? I was an overseller, yeah. a back-end seller, a yeah. bullshitter, and a liar. Yeah. Like Ray Lewis told me, two types of people, those who manipulate and those who motivate. I was a manipulator. Mm -hmm. And then through the process of what we'll get to, you'll yeah. see that I made a major shift in my life to be a motivator. So there were times too where you would multi-million dollar deals where you would sort of fib and then that would result. And did that eat at your conscience bullshit, at the man. time? Yeah, of course. Because, and that's yeah. what projected my insecurity, right? That's my worthiness. Yeah, right? yeah. Because it wasn't of true value. It wasn't being a good guy. You know, it wasn't like I did anything illegal. It was just, you, it's like a car salesman. Yeah, you just. Right? You omit stuff. You, you embellish, oversell. Right, you right, back right. end sell. Right. Right. You, and you've been, back, look, everybody here has been oversold, back end sold, manipulated, and, and even lied to in a sale. Right. And it comes out. That's why, like, even on my, you know, social media now, mm -hmm. I don't BS around. I give you my book and pay for shipping. 
right? Like, yeah. Everybody knows what it feels like when I'm like, hey, you can have my book for free. And you check out, it's 1995 for shipping or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on now. <laughs> Come on. You know, I, I drive a Volt for a reason so I can afford to pay for shipping. I had a video the other day. I'm sitting, I got canceled to take my daughter to college. I was like, see that plane behind me? That's Southwest. I could have easily just taken a private when that, my plane got canceled to New Orleans with me, my wife, and my daughter. But then I couldn't afford to pay for all the shipping so that people can actually get my book for free. Because I know that if you get my book, that I'm helping the universe. Like I know if you follow like Think and Grow Rich, you follow that book, you follow Connected to Goodness, I promise you every time you read it, you'll get richer. In more ways than one. More ways than one. Empowered with passion, purpose, and profitability. Nice, man. This is really good. So then let's go back. So you're, you're so three years job. into it. You're yeah. training, killing so it. Get, you're well, making millions at this time. For, yeah. yeah, you get bought out. So we out. got bought out for $3.4 billion. Billion with a B. Billion with a B. Yeah, that's when billion was a lot. Yes. <laughs> and how old are you at this time? You're like 28? <laughs> yeah, 27. 20s. Okay. So I'm 27. I'm the youngest executive. And you're hot shit, right? Ego's through the exactly. roof. Exactly. Ego's yeah. through the roof. I have a little bit of kitty stock enough to build a house in Monarch Beach here. Right. Right. You bought your mom a house. I bought my mom now a second house, but I bought my own <laughs> house now. Yeah. My first real house. What was your first big purchase where you're like, holy shit, this is real? Was it a car? You're going to laugh. Tell me. So <laughs> it was a big screen TV. Back then they were $8,000. <laughs> Yeah, eight grand. Yeah, holy shit. That's how they're, yeah, they're yeah. big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, so you were you were spending money just having fun. Just yeah, but that was the night. first big purchase that I made because I always equated like being super rich to someone owning one of those. Big TV, yeah. Yeah, and watch all the football games. On. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And in fact, when I broke up with my fiance, I bought a condo, a convertible. All, I gave all of it to her. I t I said I wanted two things back. She cheated on me. No Thank way. Goodness. Thank wow, goodness. Wow, dude. Thank goodness. But because at the I, time, did it, did it fuck you up mentally? No, because I literally, I, I knew that I had gotten engaged for the wrong reasons. I, I got a wonderful girl. She, she was young. She was a senior in college. I was a third year law student. But I fell in love with her dad. Multi, multi-millionaire. <laughs> so you saw, you had your eye on the prize. It's the money, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a nightmare. <laughs> I am a nightmare. Even the girl I'm engaged to yeah. is because I want to be rich. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm being honest. Most yeah, guys yeah, won't yeah. say that. Yeah, no, no, but it's and, true, and it has yeah. nothing to do with the girl or yeah. her family. They're wonderful, right? This is my own stupid sickness. Right, right, yeah. So, you know, I get engaged for money. Now I got my own money. And she's not feeling it, right? Right, and so she kisses some other guy. I use that as my excuse. Yeah, to get out. Yeah, I give yeah. her everything because I feel guilty, except for I wanted my ring back. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that. I, I yeah. did. I wanted my ring back, <laughs> and she cried to me. She comes from a multi rich family that I, I wanted to take the big screen. So I drove over to the Incredible <laughs> Universe, yeah. bought her one, yeah, so I could take the original big purchase with me because I felt it was good luck. Yeah, it was like symbolic of everything you've worked it for was. and wanted. Yeah, I carried yeah. that thing till it was like 16 different squiggly marks. <laughs> yeah. We had this beautiful home in Rancho Santa Fe. I'm not lying. I had that in the family room. And my wife is like, Dave, the movie theater has a beautiful TV. Our bedroom. Yeah. Why is this sitting here? I'm all, it's good luck. Now, lo and behold, I replaced it and went bankrupt. So yeah. needless to say, I must have felt something about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, so you know, here I am. I had the kitty stock. I move out, build this house, and now I go to dinner with uh, Lord Thompson. He wants to convince me to stay on because every other old executive, they owned. It was a private company. Right. I mean, if you're a one percenter, you had thirty-four million dollars. If you were a half percenter, you had 17 million. If you were a quarter percenter, right, you had 8 million. And if you had a tenth of the percent, you got 3.4 million. There was no loser in the situation. There was no yeah. loser, right? And my kitty stock was enough to buy a Monarch Beach home and build yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't yeah. buy it, I built it. Yes. Well, now. So here you're in your late 20s, late tw I, more money than you ever dreamed of. And I, they were offering me an executive job with Thompson Warrior to stay on. Yeah. Lord Thompson himself said, What do you need? I, he, I, he said, I said, besides money? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And he, he said, yeah. I said, make me a duke. <laughs> and he started laughing. He's like, Jewish duke? I was like, seriously, make me a duke. You're a lord. Make me a duke and I, I'll do the deal. Yeah. And everyone at the table got really quiet. Yeah. Well, nah, just kidding. Yeah. So I'll yeah, take yeah. the money. Yeah. So well, I you took tested it a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I took the money. Uh, but I was smart enough now. When, another insecurity. When I graduated law school, I had ESQ on everything. It was because I wanted to make my mom proud, right? Right, right. So I'd go into law office, and all I was was a salesman, and I'd make sure that they knew, right? One, I was a lawyer. Say ESQ, right? I'm a lawyer. First and I foremost. I passed the bar. Yeah, yeah. And I'm rich. 
<laughs> I make more money than you. Yeah. Don't look down on me, Mr. Lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Like that, it was it was sickness. Yeah. Anyway, so it's crazy. I started branding myself as a technology guy. I started realizing, wait a second, I'm in the mid '90s now, '95, '96. Right. The internet boom started to happen. Coming, it's not yeah. a fad. I better start telling people, hey, I was in charge of seventeen billion dollars in revenue. I know the internet. I know how to monetize the internet. Right. So Anderson Consulting was a censure. We went ahead, boom, uh, became uh, a $169 million startup they hired me for because I branded myself. So now I'm a 28-year-old like tech, yeah. tech guy, director, Silicon Valley, network with TPG, Sequoia, Amarendo, HP Ventures. Biggest Venture Biggest venture capitalist in the world, yeah. Started learning that game. And you're thinking, thank God I didn't take mom's advice. Oh, yeah. I just got the law job. But I love her more than trajectory. anyone in my, in my life. And yeah. she's given me the worst advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just true. Yeah, Sorry yeah, yeah. about it. It's a good lesson. And then, uh, so then I get exposed to carriers, app companies, hardware. Samsung wants to get in the phone business. And are, are you finding, by the way, that all these, as all these opportunities come up, because one thing we found in interviewing executives, right, to most people, even you when you were younger, hearing these numbers and names is like, oh, my God, it's so big, right? But when you're in it, did part of you feel like, holy shit, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just going to kind of wing it. And as you wing it, you just sort of, yeah. You, Total fraud. So, and that exists at that level, right? The whole time. Yeah. I fought it. I fought it. I, I, in between the numbers, I, I, I felt... Look, like I'm no in technology. How this I have no engineering degree. Happen. I have a law degree. Yeah. I'm an English poli sci and kinesiology <laughs> minor. Yeah, yeah. Right? I sold shit. Yeah. And then because I could sell pretty You're soon. In the mix of imagine all these, I felt yeah. when I was CEO of PC Phone, Samsung's first manufactured smartphone in the world. And I'm with Gates and Dell and all these guys. I'm playing in the Fortune magazine CEO invitational. The, and I'm the keynote speaker at Comdex, which is like CTIA. Yeah. And in your mind, are you thinking, holy shit, I hope nobody knows I'm a yeah, fraud? I'm a fraud. Right. Basically, I kept saying, thank God I can sell. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because and, and the truth is the reason Samsung became the second largest manufacturer of phones in the world. That fraudness came out because, you know, I couldn't run a business that big. Right. Yeah. At some point, it was bound to turn into it. Yeah. So I left. So the trajectory of it. So the company blows up, gets bought out. You get equity. You start branding yourself as the tech guy. Now I, you're... Everyone headhunts me in Silicon Valley. I go to every path of wireless proxy server, middleware company. I'm smart enough to understand trends. Right. I knew wireless was the next big thing. Right. So I went into the middleware space, did real well. Samsung then hires me as a 32-year-old CEO of PCE phone. Uh, and, and the salary was the most you've ever experienced in your life. Yeah, stock. And I was yeah. involved in some serious stock plays and real estate plays. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was up 20 hours a day because I would wake with Squawk Box. You know, Maria was right there. Yeah. Young Maria. Yeah. And uh, she still is beautiful. But I just would wow. watch that. I, and Where did you meet, where did you meet your, your current wife? Uh, fourth grade. Really? Yeah. So I love, I was the first boy ever to ask my uh, wife to go steady. She said no. M Maria, right? Uh, my, my wife's Julie. Oh, wife Maria Julie. Bartholomew is a girl on Squawk Box. But oh, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Now I got you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Julie, uh, I went to sixth grade camp with and had my best friend ask her to go steady. She said no. So I threw an egg at her, rocks at her. Yeah. Uh, and not until Send after. Her a message, right? Yeah. Yeah. And my cousin was my best friend. Never wanted to see or to t talk to me because I was a jerk. Right. Uh, later on in life, after I broke up with my fiance, I, her mom had passed away, and I bumped into her in Mexico, literally, physically, in a crowded bar, bumped into her. I always say her mom pushed me. Yeah. Because her mom, when she ran into me in law school, her mom said, you should date Dave Meltzer. And oh, she wow. She said, oh, he's engaged. She goes, you should date someone like him. So I always said her mom pushed me into yeah, to yeah. her. Uh, started dating, and uh, but I have loved my wife since I was nine years old. From the first time she skateboarded by my house, she didn't feel the same about me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you met her in the club, you guys struck up a conversation, and at that time you were doing well. Really well. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. In fact, my friend was bragging for me. And I threw away her number because I thought she still thought I was a jerk. Yeah, yeah. And she ended up calling me, and then yeah, things worked out really yeah. well. Four kids and. She's wow. the best thing that ever. She saved my life. So, what are, what are your three tips for people out there, entrepreneurs, people trying to go for their goals in life on relationships? What would be your top three tips on picking the right person? Picking the right person for relationships. Well, number one, communication. So, I actually have four tips, which are my four guys. One, make sure you both are gracious, meaning gratitude. If you're both thankful, then you appreciate one another. That adds value to the relationship. 
Two, especially if you're married to me, forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, patience and forgiveness. So huh? you got gratitude, forgiveness, accountability. Mm-hmm. This is something that most people don't understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, in a relationship, when you start taking, what will ruin a relationship is that blame, shame, and justification, right? Imagine my relationship being with my mom. What if I blamed her for all my problems? That's what happens in a relationship when you're married. You're the one that lost the house. You're right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, effective communication and effective communication is how do we uh, uh, communicate or emotionally connect as one this way, but also how, how do we connect emotionally to that which inspires us? Mm-hmm. God, Jesus, Buddha, Mahatma, Joseph Smith, whatever you believe in the 12th mm-hmm. man, I don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. So those four things are the best piece of marriage advice I can have is have those four tenants in your relationship and you'll survive forever. I'm 21 years married next week. Nice, man. I did want to ask because a lot of people will hear a lot of the you know business stuff, the story, but they might linger on that. So I definitely wanted to push on that. So, but I love that. It's great. So then go on. So Samsung. Yeah. So there I was, multimillionaire. I retire. Used to tell people I retired. They threw me out, gave me a ton of money. What's, what's a ballpark of your net worth at this time? Probably about 22 million when I, at that point, and I built it up to about 120. 120 million. Uh, total before. Uh, what happened was, man, I, I had the right stocks. I had the right real estate. I was leveraging everything. I bought, I bought a golf course. We put uh, $12 million into it. It became the eighth best golf course in the nation called Poplar Grove, worth over $120 million in paper. I had a ski mountain in Montana. We're in Beef Trail in, yeah. in Montana, 52 lots. Wow. Uh, condo conversion. What happened was I was a jerk, an idiot. Wasn't My wife warned me. Yeah. Here's the interesting about for entrepreneurs, right? I surrounded myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas. Meaning, what were they? What were they going doing? to strip clubs, doing drinking, right. drugs, not paying attention to my business because everything was going fine. So great, yeah. yeah. No mentorship, uh, no passion, no purpose, lots of profitability. <laughs> and uh, my wife warned me two years before I went bankrupt. My wife warned me that I wasn't paying attention. She wasn't happy, mm-hmm. and so I went and uh, changed my life. I started living by gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effective mm-hmm. communication. My wife told me, go back, take stock in who you were and what you want to become or I'm leaving. And I know there's a story too that you shared and I would love if you could share it about the day where you said, well, what, honey? You're, you should be happy. Look around at this, the Ferraris, this, that. that. The day. And I'm she goes, I'm not looking at any of that. I'm looking at you. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I actually, I came home. I was with Little John at the Grammy Awards. Yeah, and a I hip-hop came, artist. Hip-hop artist. Gotcha. Came home five something in the morning, high as a kite. Yeah. And she's waiting at the doors. We have this beautiful four car garage with all the yeah. windows, and I can see her silhouette. What cars are in the garage? Uh, at that time, I had a Carrera Four Cabriolet. I had the Ferrari. We had a, a SUV. We had back then it was a um, Navigator. Mm-hmm. The Lincoln, Lincoln Navigator. Navigator. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we had three cars in there, and. and uh, a water thing, a jet ski. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, but walk up, I'm a little bit nervous, and she looked at me, and she's. I open the door, and she goes, "You." And I've never seen her so pissed. You, you are not a rock star. And I looked at her, and I go, "I may not be one, but I sure feel like one." <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, so that's when she told me, you know, take stock in who I was. I'm like. What are you talking about? I, I've never even seen her mad at me. Like our life was so blessed. Yeah. We had a live-in nanny. Yeah. Right. I mean, we had, she never worked. Yeah. Right. We had everything I ever wanted. Wow. And was it as sweet as you dreamed it would be when you were younger? Like when you were thinking about all this stuff and then living it? Was it? So I. You get I, what I'm asking? I, yeah. So I tell people this all the time. I, I'm not one of those guys that say don't own a Ferrari. I drive a Chevy Volt today. But I'm not telling you not to own a Ferrari. I believe get what you want in life, learn from it. If if it keeps you happy, keep it. If it doesn't make you happy, get rid of it. Hopefully right. for a profit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but that was been my philosophy. And so, you know, I, I really I, I lost everything, right? But I will tell you, I enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't I don't have any regrets other than my own ego. Like that my, my only regret isn't what I lost. My my regret is how I acted. You know, mm, like my regret you is were, the embarrassed. How you were yeah, the embarrassment the of having to tell people like thoughts that went through my head, like, do you know who I am? 
or you know, like this, what I've done, or yeah, yeah like yeah. bragging, like in the first minutes about the money you have or whatever. You know, that's not my legacy. So what what caused you to to lose it all? Um, so real simply, economically, what caused me to lose it all is I wasn't paying attention, but I didn't ask for help. Uh, if what what happened was I had a lot of equity. But in my mind, in my experience, because I didn't ask for anyone to help, right. I didn't understand that I'd gone through my liquidity and lawsuits and ca- you know dumb shit, all sorts of so stuff. So it wasn't yeah. that liquid, you know. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot Th- of people like things that. were tied up, percentages. It's just yeah, so well, much I had plenty of equity. I figured yeah. I was just refinance. Exactly, and you have so much money anyways that it's like the margin of difference will just. Ca- and so take what happens care of is anyways. your net worth goes down because the market crashes, the real estate market, the stock market crashes. So the equity and everything. Right. So, but I still have equity. I'm not upside down. I still have equity, but I can't borrow against it because now the banks are in trouble. Right. And they're not taking risk. And I have so many properties, they're not letting me even take a, it's my money. Right. Yeah. So I can't sell out of my stuff fast enough. Right. And the market's going down. So I finally get to a point where it's like I owe people money. I still have equity. So my bankruptcy was a little bit different. It was one of accountability because I had switched my paradigm of value two years earlier. I started living towards that pursuit of my potential. I started living of service. I I changed the prayer in my head every morning to not what can I get, but can God put 10 people in front of me that I can help? And this is when you lost it all. that you Before I lost it all even. So, and you talk about the, the lag time, right? So you yeah, started, there's a lag. People don't get that so, lag time. So things were on the decline, even though you were now sort of spiritually going up, but the, the trend was already downward. Yeah. So by the time it was already too late anyways. Yeah. Wow. So I made that decision uh, to walk away. And, and you're 32, pay, 32 at this time. Uh, no, when I walked away, when I went bankrupt, I was 37. 37. Yeah. So quit uh, PCE phone at 32. Made more money through these, you know, angel investing and all this. All these millions stuff. of dollars up to the nine figure Born network. idiot by 35. <laughs> Real uh, 38, 36, my wife has, 35 and a half, my wife has the talk within the two years. Right. By 37, file for bankruptcy. By 38, it's done. I'm bankrupt. I lost everything. There, everything. Yeah. And we had a vicious lawsuit with a neighbor of ours that, you know, broke the law and did all these other things to take my stuff. Uh, really? Yeah. Like, I mean, literally took every piece of furniture out of my house. What? what just because even exempt stuff. This in in yeah. in the bankruptcy court. This did really not like would put letters in the mailbox telling our friends, you know, went to my wife's family. Uh, you know, I, I'd been really gracious to my wife's family. I let uh, one of uh, her cousins buy into my construction business on a UCC filed note, which I never. But he went to him and said I was going to take his house. You know, oh, made it sound, man. and yeah, then yeah. then the lawyer and the accountant, they were all connected, and my accountant was telling them that, you know, I was using the money for me. Like, this. Yeah, yeah, and so, so it, much it, it tangly was, web. Yeah, and yeah. it was blame, shame, and justification. In fact, today, a couple of her family members still, like, aren't interested in, in talking uh, to her. Well, now they want to talk to her, but they still see me as that In hypocrite. that light, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? I take accountability for it. That's all I can say. And if they, look... I forgive people not not for them, for me, and I forgive them, right? I forgive it because I deserve to forgive them. Yeah. If it, look, one thing you can learn about the internet: there's now four billion people on it. You know, give me 001 percent of them that love me, that get what I say, that tr- that believe into the values that I have, right? Well, just 001 percent of them. That's four hundred thousand people, right? I'm there already. 400,000 people on this earth right now mm-hmm. love what the message I have and they know it. The other 3 billion 999 million, million yeah. six, right 600,000 people can hate me. That's okay. But listen li- listen to why you hate me because you're just projecting your insecurity if if you don't believe in what I, what I talk about because I live as close to the truth that I can. I'm not perfect. Right. But I, I'll tell you what, you know. And you've seen what a lot of people haven't been able to see, right? What most yeah. people aspire for. So you've seen the up and the down. Yeah, and they and they jump on the bed. One of her cousins, he mad because he remember I took him to the Masters, right? And I promised him a Phil Mickelson flag. <laughs> yeah. At the time, yeah. I'm parting my butt off, doing the things I shouldn't be doing. I don't remember the stupid flag. But he brings up to my wife, like, you know, because his wife loves me, his family loves me. And he's like, right. you know, he's still a jerk. He still owes me a master's flag. Then why don't you just call me and ask me for a master flag? Yeah, Phil Mickelson's my friend. Yeah. Like, you're 50-some years old, bro. <laughs> 
Like, yeah, honest, yeah. like these are the little things. I'm like, what nonsense? A guy like that, I don't have time to change his mind. Right, yeah. You know, which is another lesson, right? Don't spend your time trying to change people's mind. You don't need everybody to love you. Right. You know, I have millions of people that love me for a reason. They love the ideas that I share. I, I work to, to be of service. I literally, you know, have given, I'm a reverse tithing guy, right? 90% of everything I have is for other people, including, I would say 100% because I don't really buy myself anything. You feel guilty now? About? About buying yourself nice stuff compared to what you used to buy? <laughs> you know, guilt is, a, is an ego-based problem, right? Okay. I, you know, for, for me... I buy what I, I need. Um, you know, I hate to tell you, but all my watches are fake. This is the best piece of uh, jewelry I own right here because Master Shaw blessed it for me. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really, if I feel guilty, I go back to center. If I feel anxious, I go back to center. Two things I do, time and ego. I keep my eye and awareness on time and ego. Whenever I'm worried about time, like things aren't happening on a certain time frame, or, right. just go back to center. Whenever I do something out of ego, anxiety, fear, need to be right, need to be offended, need to be superior, inferior, separate, whatever it is, I just go back to center. First, forgive myself, because if I forgive myself, I can give forgiveness to others, and then I get better. I just try to get better. So, so and a lot of that was born out of the, the challenging times, right? So uh, I want to get into that um, and your practices and how you, you actually apply that. But talk to me about the day when you're 37, 38, you file bankruptcy, you had $100 million plus net worth, <laughs> and just like that in a day it's over what what the hell do you do the moment you sign the paperwork and you get out of the office what, what's came, going through your mind came home how am i going to tell my mom yeah it was hard so <laughs> yeah. i went to bed that night depressed and uh woke up the next morning and my wife always says you spent one day in bed depressed and i just sat there going what and all i could think about is how am i going to go walk to my mom's house and tell her, because I lost my mom's house. Wow. But right? I was never put it in her name. Yeah. Right? I bought it for her. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure, like, payment. I, yeah, I, you I took care of everything. So she didn't feel like Yeah. It. It. it wasn't the first house I bought her, right? This was, And yeah. so. So it's 33 homes, including mom's, the golf course. All this. Talk to me <laughs> about everything you lost. What did you lose? Every single thing. So homes, condos, golf course, ski mountain, uh, all but one car, uh, uh, all my money. How many cars did you own at that time? Oh, we probably had five cars. And all but one. Motorhome. Yeah. I had a, embarrassingly enough, we had a gated community, right? Yeah. Huge home. I parked the motorhome outside the community so they could come and repo it. Wow. Um, so that nobody would see that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. But the hardest part for me, I remember in bed, it wasn't, my wife was by me. Right? So she by was the, supportive at yeah, that time. Yeah, I, I lived by like she wanted me to. And she, she wasn't even afraid. She knew that I was going to make this thing right. And does she love me more than ever? Because now I was a good husband. I was a good father. And she was by kids. your side during the tough times. And yeah. was in your ear and we got this, we get through this. Yeah. So you she probably appreciated up. that tremendously. She yeah. stepped up, sold shit on eBay, you know, like. No way. Yeah. So you went from being an executive at Samsung, CEO, running oh, billions yeah. of dollars and sales and all that, to selling this. stuff on eBay. And then remember, you have wow. pride, right? Of I, course. Our people owe me money. Still today, I bet probably owed $750,000 for people mm -hmm. that I never went and asked for. Mm -hmm. But I remember uh, <laughs> we had to get groceries and I, I didn't have any cash. And so After my choice was, I had done. rich people no in my cash. family, I had rich people. Now I felt like my mom. I manifested being my mom. Because I used to kind of resent my mom when I was five going, hey, we got rich uncles. You know, why am I on food stamps? Like, ask your brother for some cash. Now, my brothers were successful. My ego wouldn't let me do it. Too much pride, yeah. Yeah, so I remember telling my wife, hey, go in the garage. I just remembered I had a whole big water, five-gallon water thing full of change. It was like $1,200 a change. So that got <laughs> us through. And then I got a tax. Like, I got a check in the mail for tax-free. Like, yeah. things just started happening. Yeah, that just the kept universe, flow. Yeah. Yeah, and then I got the, you know, I actually already had the job with Lee Steinberg when I had to claim bankruptcy. So... One of the other things that depressed me was uh, I had gotten this job with Lee. I'm chief operating officer for Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. How do I go in and tell him I'm bankrupt? Right, because when I got hired. Well, he didn't know. You didn't, they didn't no, have any context no. yet. Now, what was worse is like, you know, that lawyer was calling and I try, tried to cover because he knew I was in the lawsuit. Yeah. But the lawyer would call and talk to Lee, like call Lee and, the, and try to sabotage my yeah. job to get me fired. And so I would play the other role like, yeah, I'm having 
trouble, but I'm going to survive. So yeah. now, you know, I went from the part of the reason that he hired me was I was a successful guy. Big shot, yeah, yeah. To like bankrupt moron. <laughs> uh, so I remember being really depressed for one day. And so I took accountability in bed. I just said, you know what? I own this, man. I, this is all my fault. Not the guy that was in the lawsuit, it, not my neighbors, not my wife for putting pressure on me for, to buy her a humongous, you know, all the things that went through my head. I owned it. And literally, I went to bed that night, one day in bed, and I woke up in the morning, first thing, and I walked over to my mom's house. Wow. She went to the door and just said, Mom, uh, I need to tell you something. Uh, you're going to have to move. I lost this house. And we can fight it in bankruptcy, you know. But because it's yours, you know, there's eviction laws. But I said, I prefer if we just find a place and I promise you I'll make it up to you. And man, I was just so blessed when she just said, that's fine. You know, just, I love you. I know, what do you need from me? You know, do you need my car? Do you need, right? Like, yeah, yeah. she wow. was like, never. I'm about, a, I'm about a tear up. Yeah, that's never crazy. in my face. Yeah. And that was my mom. And I went to work, went to work, went up to Lee's. And asked if I could talk. And he was going through a lot himself. I asked if I could talk to him. And uh, he's, he's not a big hugger. And <laughs> he held me when I was crying because I told him. And then he admitted, you know, that he uh, had gone bankrupt himself. And At that time? No, earlier. Prior, yeah. yeah so you could relate to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he said, look, man, you know, just be accountable. And, and so it was free. And that, like, I felt freer than ever once I told Lee and I told my mom. And, you know, it was interesting. I, I just, I started illuminating my problem. I wasn't going to sit there with my brothers who were super successful and be competitive. And I just took a very radical, humble spot in my life and just said, I'm going to do this the right way. And I remember after going bankrupt, I was making good money. Yeah, I wrote course. a check to charity, to Warren's charity. And Warren Moore, your, your partner. Warren now. Moon, yeah, he was he was a partner at Lee's too, and he had the Crescent Moon Foundation. And, and so, for people years. who don't know, can you talk about Lee's and how big that organization? Yeah, is? so Lee Steinberg, they made the movie Jerry Maguire after him. Cameron Crowe followed him around. He was the largest sports agency in the world, the most notable in the world. Eight first picks in a row. Wow. In a row, never could be done again. Sold his baseball practice for ninety million yeah. to Asante, uh, one of the great philanthropist of the world and I was blessed to have him as my boss mentor and eventually made me CEO of his company and you got that job just as you were having the bankruptcy so it was almost like perfect time it was a yeah. bridge if you will to say oh, I, you know like look man I got offers for jobs yeah, uh, yeah. and I was going to take one with TELUS to be president of their data division and I decided to to work for Lee by accident you know I met him and we hit it off so much like my younger brother I think that's why he wanted to hire me Lee Steinberg hired me 48 hours after he met me. He must have had thousands of resumes for people that wanted to work for him. And then eventually you would not only get the job, but move up and be CEO. From, yeah, I was COO originally. I took over for Jeff Morad, who owned the Diamondbacks at the time and eventually the Padres. Uh, but yeah, uh, it was incredible. And But I lived in a, in a different world, man. And Lee was the same way. He was a philanthropist. And I was, I was going to live my life of value. So I write this check and I ask my wife, Remember, I don't own a house. I barely own my furniture. I, I, I literally, we have to move. My wife is pregnant, by the way, with my son. Oh, is his first son or do you have kids? First son. I have three daughters. Wow. Three daughters. So you're going through a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I literally, so I'm moving in. Everything's rented. And I, I got my check and I said, hey, babe, I'm going to write this to Warren's uh, charity to give a kid a scholarship to college. And I said, are you okay with that? And she said, oh, you're learning to trust the universe. Because like, my wife, my whole life, told me I didn't get it. My whole life. So she big on like meditation and mindset. Spiritual, yeah. Really? Yeah, totally. And you're all about the money. I was all about the money. And so, always would tell so, me, so it was like a get, total just Don't get it. Yeah, in fact, now, like she laughs. She goes, I can't believe how much you've grown. Like you teach people about this stuff. <laughs> if they only knew what a moron you were when <laughs> I was trying to convince years, you that yeah. you could attract <laughs> things in your life. You could allow things to happen. Yeah. You know, like all this stuff. So I remember she goes, oh, you're learning to trust the universe. I'm like, so you're cool with this? And she looked at me and she goes, double it. No way. And I was like, I don't trust the universe that much. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I have three daughters. I'm yeah, out yeah. of bankruptcy. They're they not gotta, even we in college. We got to trust little by little. They're yeah, yeah. married. You know, and, but yes, now I'm the one that's like, double it. You know, she's like, are you sure you want to do this? I'm like, 
it's all, it's, and I don't do it, I don't give to get, right? That's right. trading. I give unconditionally. You look at the signature in my uh, emails, it says unconditionally, mm-hmm. right? That's my salutation. Because there's only two things I could put as my salutation to be true. One, that which I aspire to be. So it says unconditionally, Dave Meltzer, res ipsa loquitur. That which it is, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, or it could say this, which would be even more truthful than unconditionally, hypocritically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah. no matter what you try, we're all pursuing our potential. So we're all hypocrites. Gotcha. And so if anyone watches these videos and interviews, I know people love the Ed Milet stuff I've done and right. the impact theory and the Gary Vee stuff. Look, let me tell you this about every big guy that, that I get to deal with. We're all just trying. We're all hypocrites. Right. We're all just doing our best. We're doing our best. And so are you. So be cool with that. Know that when I say unconditionally, because I'm trying to do this without condition, judgment, I'm doing my best, but I'm a hypocrite, right? Do I get mad at my employees and lose my temper? Yeah, just for less time. Then I go back to center, right? Do I have, you know, insecurities, fears? Yeah, I just go back to center. They don't ever go past a few minutes. We're used to take days, weeks, months, spiraling all types of projection in my insecurity right. that would ruin me. I limit the amount of negative energy in my life by going back to center. And then so now, what were the practices when you started to rebuild? Was it meditation? I mean, what were the, the specific tangible things you did to bring you to center? Right. So number one, meditation. Every day? Every day, 20 minutes in the morning. My philosophy was if I could find center, then I would know when I'm off center and go back to center right. and create this flow. You have a constant inventory of where center is as opposed to most people who just kind of wake up, show up and just... Don't know how to calibrate the compass, if you will. Yeah, And then learn to detach my happiness from outcomes. Just enjoy the consistent, everyday, persistent, without quit. So is it TM, Transcendental Meditation? Transcendental or? Meditation, theta, theta Meditation, I believe in vibration. I believe in mm-hmm. you can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to than you. So you should work on how fast you're vibrating, understanding the truth vibrates the fastest. Yeah, I, I've heard you say that before. So for somebody out there that might be new to the concepts of meditation or applying it to their life or their business, what would be David Meltzer's best tips on finding center or how to incorporate it into your life? What are tangible practices? Real easy. Uh, you know, sit up straight. So I have a hard time doing so. You spine yeah. straight. Breathe in through your nose like it's coming from the end of the universe and then blow it all the way back past the ocean, right? And what you think about is nothing. That's the hardest part is people think there's supposed to be something coming to you. All that I think about is awareness. So if colors come to me, temperatures come to me, stories come to me, the higher I raise my awareness, I can start witnessing patterns because patterns are, you know, that go from the conscious of what we think, say, and do to the subconscious of what we believe into an unconscious soul, an unconscious competency, which has a duality. And the duality is quite simple. It's an energetic component and a genetic component of, of our unconscious. The genetic component is a DNA. It's a code that you've been given from about four generations down to you. Great, great grandparents, great grandparents, great grandparents and parents. Four generation. It's the, and, but that, that uh, genetic unconscious has an exogenetic shell that has an activator or deactivator. So you can activate or deactivate alcoholism, frustration. Look, you, like you said, how much of your dad do you see in me? I just started deactivating the things that I didn't like about my dad and started activating the things I do like about my dad. Activating the things I like about my mom, deactivating. Then on the energetic side, it's about vibration, right? Are we you know, energetically attracting what we want, surrounding ourselves with the right people, the right ideas? Are we raising our awareness? If I could give you any gift, Omar, it'd be one gift, awareness. If you have true awareness, you never have to work. All you would have to have is true awareness for one day. Why? Because you would be able to go right to the mercantile exchange and say, oh, I have extreme awareness. Gold is going to double tomorrow. Or gold is going to double in the next two months. Or, right, right. right? Or so even, what do you do? You know, borrow, yourself. beg, and steal all the money in the world, buy some gold because you know you have complete awareness. Awareness is awesome. It's what leads me. And it translates on the inside too. Self-awareness, Gary Vee talks about it, is doubling down on sort of your strengths, right? Being aware, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What are the things I want to create? So have you found that that, because I, I want to ask for the audience who might hear it and think like, okay, that sounds like pseudo or spiritual. Yeah, like yeah. there's one component, but a lot of people want, watching this want to get better, want to get ahead, want to get money, haven't had their own 
journey, so to speak. So how does that, those practices apply to the mindset of personal growth and income and impact and all that fulfillment? Look, you got to be more interested in the interesting. You got to gather data. But once you gather the data, you got to have awareness and make your decision. Notice you get to interview a lot of powerful people. Yes. We all make decisions quickly. Right. There, there's yes. no. It's True. all. And it's imperfect. You don't even know if it's good, bad. It's just it's better it's to make the wrong thing yeah. quick than it is to sit there and confuse. In the event, uh, like what I believe, I also think that we all are optimists or optimists or like my grandfather, who's Papa, I call him the optimist. You're at the highest level of understanding that my decision today may not put me where I think I'm supposed to be, but eventually it'll get me there. Think about the manifestation of the fact that I went to law school to be a sports agent. If you would have told me yeah. <laughs> that's true, yeah. 15 years later that I would have run the most notable sports agency in the world by not practicing law, <laughs> right? <laughs> Studying maritime law, right? Uh, going into technology, selling legal research onto a wireless proxy server, then on to being, you know, CEOs, you know, CEO of their phone, yeah. then retiring, getting into real estate and stocks, yeah. right? And then going bankrupt, and that's how I was going to be the CEO of the most notable sports agency in the world. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't trust the universe. That's true. I believe that most successful people understand one thing, that they live in favor. They live in a world of more than enough. And when you live in a world of more than enough, it all comes to you. Even if your current reality is not that. By living it in your mind, it starts to attract it. Yeah, time's a construct. So then how do you rebuild that? You know, you go through the tough time, yeah. you get the job with Lee, you've now translated into in other things. Obviously now you have TV shows, you have books, philanthropy. Podcast. Talk to people a little bit now, yeah, about kind of other things you have going on now and also what's close to your heart with the nonprofits and stuff right. you're involved in. So it's for me about passion. You know, once I get my passion, then I think about a purpose for that passion. And then I make sure it's tied into profitability. I'm different than most philanthropists. I've written a book called Compassionate Capitalism. I believe in one thing about this vibration, this pragmatic world we live in, that if you want to have options, if you truly want to help people, you got to make money. So I tie everything to a direct path to revenue. And I do it for the purpose of helping others and with the passion for me of being of service. In fact, I started realizing at my core, my name in itself, the name David means beloved. Uh, Meltzer actually means waiter. What does a waiter do? They're of service. So I'm beloved of service. That's my passion, right? Empower others to power others to be happy. Elevate others to elevate themselves. It, you know, like all types of, of things you can do. And it leads a vertebrae to me that, you know, I, I've always had this kind of go, like, you, there's, nobody's more busy, right? There's 24 hours. I'm it's be as active as you can. I look at life with, two, with a lens, a two-pronged lens, productivity and accessibility. How productive am I? How much value can I provide all day long? And two, how accessible am I to others? And how can I access that which inspires me? Data, help, whatever it is. And if you look at life with productivity and accessibility, right, you can manifest whatever you want. When you le learn that ego and time are constructs, they're man-made things, they're constructs. Time has nothing to me. So for me, when I have books, podcasts, speeches, I have a media company, I have a marketing company, all these things, to me, they're not, they're, they're not separate businesses. It's simply my job is to put forth action to help other people and value and then have as many silos because beyond the businesses I have, I have, I sit on 40 some boards. Beyond that, I have probably 200 channel partnership agreements where I make referral money because I ask you, how can I be of service? And I want to monetize it. So if you tell me, man, I'm looking for a $10 million house, I got a channel partnership with Ben Anderson next door that he gives me a commission for bringing you there so he can do your $10 million mortgage. Then I got another one for the realtor that's going to give you, and they're all best of breed guys. Okay. So I'm doing you a service. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Now, I, I love that you, you come from a place of service, not getting, right? Yeah. Giving, not getting, and you trust that the universe responds to that. Now, um, But you got to ask for it. Right, yeah. Now, I want to talk about that. How important do you feel networking is and what are your best strategies in finding a powerful network like that? Because it's key to your success uh, at every level. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm very strategic about networking. I do it through helping other people. I find the people that I want to be around, what charities they're involved with, and then I get serious about helping that charity, knowing that I can connect emotionally for you and ask you how I can be of service to you. 
the way I made my money back, you know, you probably know the story, right? right. It's like literally, I wanted to be around Steve Wynn and they had Larry Rouveau had an event, Keep the Memory Alive event in Las Vegas around all these billionaires. And Steve Wynn introduced me to one of his friends. He said, oh, you know, I need to, to get these watches. And I'm like, oh, give me a list of what you need. I know a bunch of guys in the watch business. And I ended up creating a margin. But, you know, when you're playing in, you know, eight zeros, yeah, yeah. You can make some serious, and I'm helping them. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, They yeah. made more money than me. You're just helping at a higher level, the, yeah. The thing, the key too is like, there's a lot of people of service, but they're not asking. Like, dude. They're just not afraid to ask. If yeah. you unconditionally help people, don't be afraid to ask back. You've created a void. Don't be afraid to ask for the money. You yeah. wanna test how much you have a problem with limiting your value. Go ahead and try to dream about making $100 billion and see how you feel compared to, just feel the energy that I'm gonna make $1,000 today or even $10,000 today. There's a piece when you close your eyes, even you, Omar, close your eyes and think about, I'm gonna make $100 billion today and compare that to I'm gonna make 10,000. There's a disconnect in your heart. A, a, sense, of, a sense of truth, yeah, 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 that you feel, is it too You're far? You're bullshitting yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's where the ask come in, man. I started feeling better. I still am not to $100 billion. 100 million, I feel as comfortable as 100. It feels the same, <laughs> yeah. right? 100 million, no problem. A billion, I'm almost there. 100 billion, I don't understand how they do it. Right. But when I was a kid, it was a million. I dreamed of having a million dollars, and the way I feel about 100 billion is the way I felt about a million when I was five years old. And so at some subconscious level, you were you were then, that was your center in, in worse, a certain context. Worse, unconscious level. Yeah, right? yeah. I had to deactivate and activate my DNA. I had to shift my energy so that it became part of my perspective. That's powerful. So looking back, if Dave could redo his whole life over, right? The good, the bad, obviously, you know, it made you who you are today. But what, what are some top three wisdoms? Like if Dave Meltzer could share with the world top three or four things, what would it be? Number one, uh, be kind to your future self. If every situation I was in, I thought about it in the context of being kind to my future self. Money, relationships, trash on the street. Uh, so that number one would be kind to my future self. Two, uh, do good deeds. Uh, the universe doesn't know size. If you can, you know, and I know it ties into being kind of, like, look for good deeds. Just little ones, whatever it is, there's so, every a day. A smile to somebody, yeah, a compliment, you. anything. Yes, 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 just no idea. And, and then lastly, ask for help, man. Ask big and ask for help. I, I didn't feel worthy of it. I was ego-based. If you want to live in radical humility, ask for help. Now, in terms of the network, and I do want to end with this before I have one more question, sure. um, because I feel like networking is huge, right? Who you know. So for somebody out there watching this that might want to like build their network to build their business, what would be David Meltzer's like top three tips to being an effective networker, an effective human connector, going from not knowing anybody to building a contact list? It's four things. You need to break it down into the four realms of networking. You can network in person, you can network on the phone, you can network via email, and you can network via social media. Then when you break it down into a strategic point that every day, everyone out there, you want to be a huge networker, doesn't take long. Every day, stay focused and ask or attract, meaning ask somebody for help or tell somebody something that attracts them to want to help you. Right. Just one person in person, one person on the phone, one person via email, and one person via social media. If every day, every day, consistently, persistently, in the pursuit of your potential, enjoy it, at the end, of one week, you would have asked and attract 28 people. At the end of one month, 112 people. You want to change your position in life? Ask and attract 112 people a month. Trust me, your life will change quickly, especially if you're asking and attracting and doing, being more interested than interesting and doing the right things to strategically say, I'm going to ask and attract people worth more than $10 million. 28 of them a week, 112 of them a month. Your life will change because guess what people like to do? help other people. It makes them feel good. Right. Just ask and attract. That's powerful. And then in terms of the fulfillment, what have you found as somebody who's built a nine-figure net worth, the ups and downs of life, you've associated with big people, made money, lost money, had the things, didn't have the things. What's the key to fulfillment to somebody watching this and really thinking about how they want to make their life? What's, what's your, your best advice on that? You know, for me, it's have three priorities about what you want at all times. And then make a minimum amount of time every day 
consistently, without quit persistently, three things that you want in your life that you're going to enjoy, the pursuit of the potential of those three things. So put a minimum amount of time on three things at all times. And when it becomes part of your unconscious, think of another one. But always have three priorities that you consistently, persistently pursue the pursuit of your potential and enjoy it. Detach from the outcomes, have goals, but make them mile markers. Don't make them endings. What's more important to focus on, the mile marker or the big game? So say someone wants to make a million bucks. See, the big game is my mile marker because I believe uh, the universe, I'm limiting the universe. Yeah, so, so the big game I believe and then... Get your big game, have it be a mile marker in your head, but then think about today, right? What do I need to do today to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. I'll get there. Now, and also lose that judgment. It may seem like, man, I'm going in the wrong direction. But the wrong direction, you know, selling legal research online yeah, yeah. may be the key yeah. to you being a sports agent. Yeah, and if you're logical instead of energetic about it, the energy will lead you to where you want to go. But if you're so logical, you could get in your own way and cut yourself off from where you were headed anyway. Trust the universe, man. That Trust makes sense. Universe. All right, so in closing, we play a game called First Things First. I don't know if you've heard about this game. A little bit. But basically how it works is I'm going to rifle off 10 words or phrases, and then you tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Sure. Make sense? Yep. Now, before I ask this, um, or before we play this, I do want to ask about the Time magazine. Uh, or I saw you the cover there in the office about Humanitarian of the Year. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Ah, uh, Yeah, I won uh, Variety Magazine's uh, Sports Humanitarian of the Year, uh, which is the biggest honor that I've been given. Morgan Freeman, Seth Rogen, Matthew McConaughey, Gina Rodriguez, and me. So you can imagine I have Academy Award winners. Yeah. And I'm and then David Meltzer. Yeah, give a speech, somehow. which I got to say, like, <laughs> what the hell am I doing? I literally my speech was, I know you got two questions. Who the hell are you and why are you here? <laughs> uh, so anyway, I have uh, been the chairman of Unstoppable Foundation, and we've been able to impact 75,000 people. And I'm currently building a community center, raising over another million dollars to do that. And uh, Cynthia Kersey, who's one of my mentors and best friends, uh, made that for me. Yeah, as yeah. A humanitarian. Oh, that's an amazing. You've had an amazing story, and then rebuilding this with Sports One Marketing and helping the people you have. It's been an amazing story. So so far, it's a yeah, journey. So far, yep. Yeah. Um, so you ready for the game? I'm ready, man. All right. So the first word or phrase that comes to mind, the only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Fair enough. Makes sense? So number one, money. Happiness. Number two, passion. Purpose. Number three, fulfillment. <sighs> Legacy. Center. Peace. Your bankruptcy. Learning. Your past. Happy. Oh, uh, uh, appreciation. Passion. You said purpose, right? Wasn't that already said? Uh, well, passion wasn't said. Oh, I thought it was. All right. Uh, passion is inspiration. Uh, Only the tape will tell whether he said it twice. Yeah, we'll check it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, bankruptcy. I know he said that one, right? It's uh, lessons. Lessons? Yeah. Um, your wife. Savior. Your story. Continuing. And the last one, you ready? Service everything i love it thanks so much Dave. thank you omar you've been of service today thank, thank you. you guys so much for tuning in you guys can check out more of david's info in the description below see you guys next time if you guys enjoyed that video be sure to hit that subscribe button right now because every week we bring you the very best in personal development content interviews and insights to help inspire you to take your life and your dreams and make them a reality and also if you want to know how to book dream guests the same way i have you can check the link below for my top three secrets. So if you have a podcast or a show or whatever it is and you want to collaborate with them, if you click that link below, I'll give you those top three secrets to help you get in touch with anybody. And also, don't forget that the Passionate View is available on media platforms as well. So you can subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, thank you for being one of the Passionate Few.